Okay, today I have for you the third installment of Epic History TV's Napoleon series, uh, Austerlitz 1805. I'm going through the entire series piece by piece, and so this is the next step. So let's dive right in. An Epic History TV History March collaboration, supported by our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. In December 1804, in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself Emperor of the French. Europe had never seen such a sudden and dramatic rise to power. A son of impoverished Corsican nobility to military dictator of France in little more than ten years. Revolution and war had cleared Napoleon's path to the throne war would dominate his ten-year reign. A conflict unprecedented in history that would leave millions dead and a continent in turmoil. Eight months after Napoleon's coronation, the French Empire and its Spanish ally were at war with Britain and Napoleon had assembled an army of 180,000 men along the Channel coast. But as long as the British Royal Navy ruled the seas, invasion was impossible. But nor could Britain challenge France on land. And so British Prime Minister William Pitt tried to build a European coalition against Napoleon, using diplomacy and gold. Britain would prove Napoleon's most steadfast enemy, and its press delighted in relentless mockery of the French Emperor. Britain and France were old rivals, in Europe and overseas. But now, Pitt feared Napoleon's conquests had made France too powerful. The French Emperor had to be defeated, and Europe's balance of power restored, if there was ever to be lasting peace. Pitt found willing allies in Europe, among monarchs who despised Napoleon as a product of the French Revolution and a dangerous threat to the existing order. Austria harboured the deepest grievances, having seen her influence in Germany and Italy steadily eroded by French victories. The final straw came in May 1804, when Napoleon had also crowned himself King of Italy in Milan. Austria, Russia, Sweden and Naples joined Britain in an alliance known as the Third Coalition, and devised an ambitious plan for a series of joint offensives against France. The main attack would be made by a combined Austro-Russian army, advancing across the Rhine into France. But Napoleon got word of their plans, and reacted with typical speed and decision. He was determined to strike first, before the Allies could join forces, and ordered his army, now renamed La Grande Armée, to march to the River Rhine. His target was the Austrian army of General Mack, which had made a premature advance against Bavaria, a French ally and was now dangerously isolated from the other Allied armies. Napoleon ordered Marshal Murat, his famously flamboyant cavalry commander, to make faint attacks through the Black Forest, while the rest of his army, advancing at speed, enveloped Mack's army from the north. That summer, Napoleon's Grande Armée was at its most formidable. Well-trained, highly motivated, its regiments at full strength. Yeah, you know, this is very typical of Napoleon, the automatic go-to-attack mode, um, whereas a lot of commanders would have moved to intercept and then waited for the opponent to come to them, fight on their own ground, and take on a defensive position. Um, especially this time when defensive positions were more times than not actually beneficial. Um, Napoleon didn't play defense, he just went on the attack, so as soon as there was a threat, he immediately took up, 
turn to win on the attack, whereas most commanders probably would have just sat back, let them come, and lure them into a trap or put them up against a wall and force them to retreat. Napoleon didn't play that way. Napoleon came in and was just all about the attack all the time. Um, he didn't like sieges. He didn't like defense. He didn't like any of that. He liked to be in control. I think he felt that when he was on the attack, he was in control. When he was playing defense, he was at the mercy of the attacker. So it's very typical of Napoleon. Anytime someone tries to attack him, he counterattacks before they even get a chance most of the time. Um, he'll move to intercept with the intention of attacking instead of moving into a defensive position. What's more, it had been newly reorganized according to the core system, later imitated by virtually every army in the world. Each corps, commanded by a marshal, was a mini army of 15 to 30,000 soldiers, with its own infantry, cavalry, artillery, and supporting arms such as reconnaissance, engineers, and transport. This meant each corps could march and fight for a limited time independently, allowing Napoleon to break with the old doctrine of keeping his army concentrated, and advance with his corps widely dispersed. This helped to disguise his real objective, and increased movement speed, because the army could advance along multiple roads and live off the land, taking its supplies from scattered villages, rather than relying on slow-moving supply wagons. When the enemy's main force was located, the army could quickly concentrate for battle. This is how Napoleon's army was able to move at a speed that often surprised and disorientated his enemies. And so I brought it up in the first video I did on the infantry tactics. One of the biggest things that made Napoleon as successful as he was, was the organization of his armies. So he reorganized armies into battalions, into corps, into divisions in ways that no one had done before, in ways that we still do more or less today. Um, at least this, in, in some manner, we still do it. That, that sort of division, but it, his ability to completely just redo how militaries were divided up and how they were organized was a huge factor in his success. Um, everyone else would have to hardly catch up and try to copy that because they were playing by very traditional rules and big armies clumped together and Napoleon was, as I said before, he was all about the attack. And if you're all about the attack, you need to have speed. And so splitting his armies up gave him that speed, giving him, um, giving them better organization, allowed him to attack from different areas, um, increase the chances of getting a flank, increase the chances of breaking enemy lines, um, allowing you to attack multiple, posi multiple positions at the same time. Um, he was all about the attack, he was all about speed, and was the organization of his army was really built around that. Like He knew what he wanted to do. He knew how he wanted to fight, so he built his army around that, um, whereas everyone else always just played some level of the tried and true method, usually trying to take um, something of their own uh, into it, but not like Napoleon. Napoleon completely redefined everything when it came to military strategy. Um, everyone that would end up beating him turned out to have, uh, tur turned out to really be using everything that he implemented. They, they adopted a lot of what he invented. And it's really one of the reasons why they did beat him is they were able to adopt what he used and use it against him but they were never as good at it as he was until well after the Napoleonic Wars were over and they were really able to sit down, analyze everything and see what is it exactly he did? Or what is it exactly that he was doing? Um, but you can only analyze so much during wartime, you need that time after war when there was peace and you were able to get all of the information. 
from you know, your former enemy, you can get all that information, analyze all of the intelligence, and really figure out what the hell was going on, um, what made him so good, and sort of implement that into your own military doctrines. Um, some would do it better than others, but everyone definitely took inspiration from Napoleon, and like I said, we are still using a lot of his um, organization strategies today in some manner all around the world. Mac didn't realize the danger he was in until it was too late. Napoleon's fast-moving corps crossed the Danube behind him and surrounded his army. Mack launched a series of poorly coordinated counter-attacks, but despite some desperate fighting, the Austrians couldn't break out of the trap. Mack hoped that Kutuzov's Russian army could arrive in time to save him, but the Russians were still 160 miles away. And so, at Ulm, on the 19th of October, just six weeks into the war, Mack surrendered his army to Napoleon. The French took nearly 60,000 Austrian prisoners, and Napoleon had struck his first devastating blow against the coalition. Russian General Mikhail Kutuzov was an experienced and wary commander, more cautious than Mack. His army was exhausted after its 900-mile march from Russia. But hearing of the Austrians' surrender at Ulm, and knowing he wasn't strong enough to face Napoleon alone, he immediately ordered a retreat. Napoleon pursued. The Russians fought several sharp rearguard actions, but could not save the Austrian capital, Vienna, which the French occupied on the 12th of October. Kutuzov's... Yeah, once again, this Napoleon's typical strategy, you're gonna see it I mean, it's the only third video I've done, I'm sure I'm going to see it over and over again because this is what Napoleon did, is he went on the attack. Um, you were moving to attack him, he'd intercept and go on the attack. You were running away, he'd chase you down and attack. Uh, and that would lurk him into some traps, but he was always very good in this organization. His strategies were so different and so much more advanced, they didn't usually work. Um, it wasn't until they lured him deep into Russia much later on that, you know, he he finally took the horrible blow that was coming to him. Um, because why you don't invade Russia? Just don't. Just don't. If it's going well, it's a trap. <laughs> Slipped away to Olmutz in today's Czech Republic, where he was joined by reinforcements as well as Emperor Alexander of Russia and Emperor Francis of Austria in person. Napoleon was furious that Kutuzov had escaped. By now his army was also exhausted and far from home with winter approaching. He needed to force a decisive battle quickly. Fortunately for him, the overconfident 27-year-old Russian Emperor sought the glory of battle, overriding the concerns of his veteran commander, General Kutuzov. With the Allied army closing in, Napoleon ordered his corps to rapidly concentrate on a battlefield he had carefully selected. I'm sorry, I'm laughing again because I said in the last video, how come every time there's a, a big bad country and an alliance of countries that are not called the Allies. They always call them the Allies. Every time. Every time. I don't understand. At least by World War II, they just call themselves the Allies and get it over with. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just laughing at that because it, it always makes me laugh and I don't know why I'm so amused. But it's like they were the third coalition. He just said that. And then he calls them the Allies. It happens here. It happens in World War One. Happened in various other wars. Um, I don't understand, but it's, it's. I always find it amusing, and I don't know why. Near the town of Austerlitz, Napoleon oversaw the dispositions of his army late into the night, then grabbed a few hours' sleep beside a campfire. 
Dawn would mark the first anniversary of his coronation as Emperor, and promised a battle that would make or break his young empire. The morning of the 2nd of December 1805 was cold and bright with a heavy mist. Two armies of near equal size faced each other across a seven mile wide battlefield. But the Allies held the high ground of the Pratzen Heights, while French Third Corps under Marshal Davout was still marching to the battlefield. Seeing Napoleon's thinly stretched right flank, the Allies planned a large-scale attack from the Pratzen Heights to steamroller the French right, before swinging round to envelop Napoleon's army. Little did they know, Napoleon was counting on his weak right wing luring the Allies into just such a move, whereupon he would launch his own attack on the Pratzen Heights to cut the Allied army in half. His bold plan relied on his correct prediction of Allied movements, the speedy arrival of Davout's Third Corps on his right, and a perfectly timed counterattack. The battle began around 7 a.m. as Austrian troops of General Keinmeier's advance guard clashed with French troops defending the village of Telnitz. In the face of overwhelming odds, the French fought stubbornly and bravely, but gradually they were forced back. But the Allies, instead of carrying out their great enveloping attack, did nothing. The morning mist and the late arrival of orders had led to confusion and delay, and it was another hour before the first three Allied columns were on the move. Soon, fierce fighting erupted around Sokolnitz's village and castle. Marshal Davout's corps, which had just force-marched 70 miles in two days, now arrived to strengthen the French right wing. Around 9am, his lead infantry brigade appeared suddenly through the mist and retook Telnitz, before being driven back in turn by Austrian hussars. Two more of Davout's brigades reinforced French troops at Sokolnitz. As the mist began to clear, Napoleon saw that, as he'd hoped, the Allied left was moving off the Pratzen Heights, and he ordered Marshal Soult's 4th Corps to begin its attack. To the alarm of Allied commanders, two French infantry divisions, until now hidden by the mist, were suddenly seen advancing straight towards the Allied centre. General Kutuzov was forced to hurriedly organise a defence of the heights, using troops of four column. Two hours of bloody fighting followed. Musket fire was so rapid and furious that both sides were soon low on ammunition and turned to the bayonet. By 11am, the French, with the advantage in training and discipline, had secured the heights, and driven a deep wedge into the Allied position. To the north, a giant cavalry battle developed. While a Russian force from General Bagration's advance guard captured the village of Bosenitz, before it was halted by cannon fire from the Santon Hill. A decisive charge by six regiments of French heavy cavalry finally drove back the Allies, allowing Marshal Lannes' five corps to move forward and seize Blasowitz and Krug. Now, Grand Duke Constantine, commanding the Russian Imperial Guard, led forward this last Allied reserve in a desperate bid to reclaim the Pratzen Heights. A battalion of the French 4th Line Regiment was charged down by Russian Guard cavalry, losing its eagle standard in bloody fighting. Napoleon, who'd moved up to the heights, 
sent in his own guard cavalry. In this grim melee between the elite horsemen of both armies, the French finally prevailed. Napoleon had broken the Allied centre. Now, to close the trap on the Allied left wing, still locked in heavy fighting around Sokolnitz. Around 2pm, Napoleon ordered four divisions to swing south and cut off their retreat. General Buxhauden, commanding the Allied left, only now saw the danger he was in. Attacked from three sides, the only escape was south. Many of his troops were forced to flee across frozen ponds. French you know, one thing I just want to bring up is that if you notice a lot of these commanders by the um, by the coalition countries, many of them are nobility of some type. You see it, Grand Duke this or Baron that. Um, and that sort of plays into one of the weaknesses because whereas a lot of these men and some of them were very skilled commanders, absolutely, don't get me wrong, but, but some of them were not. They were not born commanders. They may have had the training most of their life to do it, but they were not born commanders. Um, whereas the French Revolution had sort of purged that whole uh, aristocracy. They had sort of purged the, um, the sort of old guard of these, these uh, commanders who were really just nobility of a training and instead you had more of a meritocracy where people who were members of the military worked their way up to the ranks to get to these positions they weren't given to them because they were um you know born to a, a noble family so that was one of the advantages napoleon had especially early on in the wars is that he was using commanders that started off at the bottom and worked the way up and not every commander like that because obviously he had a number of commanders who were already generals and such by the time he took power but a lot of them were lifelong military men and not nobles who decided to become commanders or nobles who had been trained to be commanders and were involved sometimes and not others whereas that was the case with a lot of other countries um, I mean, I just saw it. Tsar Alexander wanted to get involved in fighting, so he goes and does it. He's he's in his early twenties. He has no experience, no real military um, leadership skills. He's got sort of a basic understanding of, of commanding, but that's it. That's and that's how a lot of these men were. They were basic understanding of commanding, and some turned out to be brilliant. Some were very brilliant commanders. Others not so much and overwhelmingly that was a problem for them because overwhelmingly so um napoleon's commanders were better just generally speaking they were better because of the fact that he didn't care where you came from you got promoted because you were good which again is how militaries are run now <laughs> And it's another way that it was a much more effective system. And so it would be adopted um, begrudgingly, but it would be adopted. The nobility was never happy about it, but as nobilities and as monarchies sort of waned and other um, ideologies took hold, especially amongst republics of many different types, that's what took over as a meritocracy within a, a military instead of nobility. Um, if nobility wanted to get involved into military, they were absolutely allowed to, and they were often still given certain preferences, but they were not made automatic commanders. Um, that would come to change, because you do see even in World War I, um, especially with Britain, but even up with others, you do see uh, nobility members of nobility or aristocracy who are military commanders but these guys join the military and they got a couple bumps in rank because of who they are but they still had to earn their rank of being a commander of being a general or or 
uh, ship captain or an admiral if they had to still earn that part. It wasn't just given to them anymore. Um, so this is definitely something that really affected these wars because Napoleon had that advantage of having better commanders because he didn't care about nobility. And the French Revolution had sort of purged them all. So many of those noble commanders who were not necessarily very good um, didn't want anything to do with Napoleon. Those who were may have been part of noble, noble families, but he sort of escaped the wrath of the revolution, um, but were lifelong military men. Some of them stuck around because despite where they came from, the military was their life. But they were also the type of men who Napoleon wanted because they were good and they were military minded. They had sort of given up on what they were born into and they had be given into being military men. Artillery opened fire, trying to smash the ice with their cannonballs. About 200 men and dozens of horses drowned in the freezing water. But not the many thousands of Napoleon's propaganda. The French Emperor had won a brilliant victory. His army had taken more than 10,000 prisoners and captured 45 enemy standards. Thousands of dead and wounded of all sides littered the battlefield. Many left untended for days. Yeah, just really quickly, look at the difference in numbers. I mean, you're talking about France versus Austria in Russia primarily in this battle. So you're talking about two countries with the aid of others versus one. And how many more men are we looking at just dead alone? I mean, almost double and wounded for prisoners is just absurd. Yeah, I mean, look at these numbers, and it just shows Napoleon's tactics, shows his strategies. He knew what he was doing. Um, and the fact that he was able to swing in and surround enemies, that can cause a lot, because when you are able to encircle enemies before you get them to surrender, there's, when we're talking about surrender in a situation like that, we are really putting you, we really mean surrender because you are really at the mercy. Um, Whereas many times surrendering is like, look, we don't want to fight anymore. We give up. This is like, you have a surrounded. You could easily just keep going and just keep kill us all. But instead of take prisoners, because it's it's easier, um, it's less brutal, saves on, 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 on ammunition, saves on uh, manpower and all that. But um, yeah, you just look at these numbers and it's amazing. And this is something that's going to be repeated all the way up until Russia. Um, where you just have this overwhelming power of of France. It's amazing. And a lot of it just had to do with, I mean, there are so many factors, but a lot of this just had to do with the brilliance of Napoleon's strategies. He can serve enemies. He lured them into traps. They thought they trapped him, and that trap was a trap. <laughs> he he really had a very, um, very strategic mind. He was absolutely brilliant. I don't think we see anyone else close to this brilliance again for a long time. Um, I think the closest we ever get again is probably uh, General Zhukov of the Soviet Union. He was another one that was brilliant. But I don't know if he's quite a Napoleon, but he's... Militarily, he's up there. Um, and Napoleon was just such a once in a... you know, once in a century kind of person. The Battle of the Three Emperors, as it became known, was a crushing blow to the Third Coalition. As Russian forces retreated back to Russia, Francis I of Austria was forced to accept a humiliating settlement with France, agreeing to pay a 40 million franc indemnity and give up more territory in exchange for peace. But meanwhile, news had reached Napoleon of a disastrous Franco-Spanish defeat at sea, off Cape Trafalgar. British Admiral Lord Nelson, at the cost of his own life, had masterminded a victory so complete 
that it ensured British naval dominance, not just for the rest of the war, but for the next 100 years. Britain... Yeah, this battle was absolutely essential. Not only to secure British dominance for a century, but it prevented Napoleon's ability to ever attack England. There's no way he's going to. And I think that's part of the reason why he goes into Russia, is he's trying to crush his enemies. And he just, he can't get into Britain. There's no way he's going to get past the Navy. And it's, it's a little funny because when we get to World War II, Hitler kind of does the same thing. He tries and tries and tries to break the British with the massive air war and um, using submarines at sea. And there's no way he's getting past the fleets necessarily, but if he can tie them up and he can get air superiority, he can try to land an invasion. And they had a whole plan to do it. They had a plan, but he couldn't quite pull it off. And before that was done, he went to Russia. Now, obviously, there's different reasons why he went to Russia, but it's sort of, I'll say it again and again, history does repeat itself. It's a cliche, but it's true. And I think that Hitler sort of had an idea that he was the next Napoleon. Um, he definitely had a mindset of really thinking he was the next Napoleon because he really did actually admire Napoleon a lot. Um, he was had nothing on Napoleon, he wasn't even close. <laughs> but um, yeah, so th this battle is absolutely essential because the British dominated the seas for the next century and even beyond. They, don't really get outdone until after world, really World War II because the Americans come up with a bigger navy, they come out of the war with a bigger navy, but Britain is still packing a huge navy today. Um, their, their navy is not nearly as big as someone like the United States, but it's highly advanced, it is very well equipped, very well financed, and it can do a lot of damage. This is sort of, you know, the British had always been a naval power and that's how they asserted themselves around the world. But this was the beginning of true dominance that before the French could always possibly be a threat. So get the Spanish. By this point, there was no way. There was no way. Um, yeah, Nelson's win there was probably one of the most important wins for the for the coalitions, um, stopping Napoleon's ability to dominate at sea stops him from going into England, because once he got into England, I don't think they would have been able to stop him. No one could stop him on ground, even when he's got to Russia, how deep it is. He, he got very, very deep into Russia. He got to Moscow, and um, it was it was the weather that did it. You know, it was weather and good timing on the Russians. Um, a lot of sacrifice in the Russians hands that, that did it but this was probably one of the most important battles of the war by far master of the sea Napoleon unbeatable on land the whale and the elephant neither able to challenge the other in its own domain when William Pitt received news of Napoleon's victory at Austerlitz he's supposed to have said roll up that map of Europe it will not be wanted these 10 years a month later, Pitt was dead. But his warning that Europe faced another ten years of war and upheaval was to prove prophetic. Napoleon Bonaparte was the ultimate disruptor of European history. One man who transformed a continent. If you want to find out more, why not try a free trial with The Great Courses Plus, a fantastic on-demand video subscription. Yeah, so these these videos are excellent. They're very informative. Um, they're relatively short. There's a lot of them. Um, the Battle of Austerlitz is really a huge win for Napoleon because it really sets the stage for the rest of the war. Um, and taking Austria out so badly, so quickly, and beating Russia back into Russia it really shows that it's going to take a lot to beat Napoleon. It's going to take, uh, it's going to
going to take Europe. It's going to take the rest of Europe to beat them, and that that is sort of what happens. Um, and and you know the British do win the huge major, the huge uh, naval war, and that is absolutely essential. Winning at Gibraltar is massively important, but it really, I don't think Britain quite comprehended how much Napoleon was going to dominate on land. Um, until after this. So we do see Britain start sending their own troops when the next coalitions form. Uh, in this particular case, it didn't. They thought they could just hold them at sea and that, you know, between Austria and, and uh, Russia, they should be able to hold them back. And it wasn't even close. You know, Napoleon had them both beat very easily. Um, also, these countries hadn't quite adopted a more total war mindset yet. They're still sending an army. They're still sending, you know, a commander. Um, they weren't going in full force quite yet. Uh, and that was a big fault because Napoleon was. Napoleon was def absolutely going into this full force. He was absolutely ready for an all-out warfare. Anything he needed to do to win, he was going to do. I don't think the other countries were prepared for that sort of thing. That's not generally how wars were fought. Once again, Napoleon is redefining things because wars are not fought that way wars are fought you send you know your best commander and an army to go intercept an enemy here intercept your enemy there you fight battles here you fight a battle there you know a few key battles as well wins wars and that's not how napoleon was doing it he was trying to he, he understood that yes the the big battles are what's going to win him the wars but that's only because that's the way that they played the game um so he's, he's beating them on their own terms, in a way, because it is their way of war, the traditional way of war, that you don't necessarily have to invade somebody to beat them at war. You don't necessarily have to inflict massive damage. You just need to beat their army. You know, whatever army they manage to throw together, beat that. Because they didn't have, well, I mean, some did, Prussia did, but they didn't have the big professional armies that Napoleon had. Napoleon had this massive army, this, this professional army at his disposal. Um, and a lot of them still weren't like that. Yes, they had soldiers that were well trained, but it was definitely a lot of these soldiers did other things. And then we put together an army of these men who were trained and we go. We don't have a sitting uh, force. We don't have a standing army ready to go. In any time, uh, Napoleon did. Napoleon absolutely did. So that was a huge factor too, because Napoleon was beating them on their own terms, but he was beating them at their own form of warfare by using his own strategies. So the advancements he was making compared to the old-fashioned ways that they had instilled was only working in Napoleon's benefit. That's it. They were not benefiting the other side at all, and the other side would have to learn to adapt to this new way of war and would have to come to accept a number of new truths that I don't think they were ready to accept early on. Um, they would have to realize that their way of war was antiquated. It was old. It was not going to work. Plain and simple. They weren't going to be Napoleon if they stuck to the um, traditional tried and true methods. They had to figure something out. And this battle, this campaign, illustrates that perfectly. Because they did everything right against pretty much anyone else. They had been fighting anyone else. They did everything right. But Napoleon is not anyone else. And they didn't know how to fight Napoleon. And so they just fell into his trap. Um, but yeah, so these videos are excellent. I do really enjoy these. I will be doing the entirety of the series, so please stick around. I will be doing all of them. I'm trying to get at least one out a week, but I'm aiming for like two a week so I can get through it. I've also started the Russian series. So the only one I've gotten so far is the 1917 Revolution. But I will be doing another one of those very soon because that one's very interesting. I do like their do videos a lot. I have plenty of other videos coming out soon too on other things. Um, but I'm going to end the video there. If you like the video, please like and subscribe. If you have any other videos you want me to check out or channels you want me to check out, 
put please put them in the comments section i will do history videos i will also do alternate history videos um, so please put those in the comments section i'll be sure to check them out and i will see you next time